uh, yeah, I'm Janta from Goyuro. I work for the BI team as an engineer, and uh, I'm going to talk about how we implemented anomaly detection with the snowplow data that we're getting. Um, first, an introduction in case nobody knows where you are. This is Goyuro. We're a search engine. Not just a search engine, but a ticket booking company for all these modes of travel, and you can go all around Europe. And um, we have a full product in 15 countries, but we're, you know, we're a growing presence in over 35 countries. We have 18 languages and 20 million plus visitors per month. And all that comes with you know, a lot of data and a lot of providers. We have partners you know, all over Europe with so many you know, buses and rails and planes and all of these things. Now let's get to the meat of it. Um, so the way we do tracking at uh, GoEuro is we have our tracking systems, Snowplow and Google Analytics. We uh, began with Google Analytics, and we are slowly moving over to Snowplow completely. Um, the reason we have not moved over completely to Snowplow yet is because there are still some dependencies on Google Analytics, and a few you know, people don't want to let go, really. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so the data from Snowplow specifically goes to S3, and you know we have daily jobs that push it into the data warehouse. We have our uh, li the real-time stream going through Amazon uh, AWS Kinesis to Amplitude, and also to you know now the anomaly detection system. Um, we also have some other plans for the real-time streaming system in the future, which I'll get to uh, later in the show. The, the uh, data warehouse has a lot of data in it. As we can see, we have 50 GB of data ingested every day, and we have a huge amount of data that we need to deal with. And with this data, we realize that a lot of times, finding the point at which uh, things break becomes critical. And we, a lot of the systems that we had which were pushing data into our system didn't have a reliable way to uh, you know, let us know when things were breaking, for example. So when uh, a system like booking or the payment system had a fewer number of payments happening or, you know, it's the amounts were changing or things were broken, it was very hard to set fixed thresholds because as a company with a lot of uh, various trends and seasonalities, it's extremely difficult to establish a fixed threshold where you can say, okay, things are broken, right? So in the middle of the night, having, you know, a certain number of, sessions a day could be a point at which where it's breaking, but you know, in the middle of the day, maybe that's not really something to be scared of. So establishing these varying thresholds was kind of a big deal. And obviously, the only way to do it is to have a forecasting system. So what we did was we took a real-time stream that we're getting from Kinesis, specifically in this case, from Snowplow, and we decided to have that fed into a forecasting system. and what we wanted to do was make sure that we had a stable system that could take in the historical data, make a reliable forecast on a daily basis or you know any kind of periodic basis, and you know predict the seasonality, predict the established patterns that we're seeing, even incorporating the trends. Um, so what we did was um, we took the uh, real-time data that we get from Snowplow in Kinesis. We fed that into a Spark streaming system, uh, which you know we just used as any kind of, we just needed some streaming system because we needed a way to be able to window that data. And for example, in our first use case, we used it uh, for our sessions, and we needed the counts for the sessions. And these counts were windowed for every minute. and dimensions were applied. So we needed to know things like, OK, so for what device type, what you know, URL host we have, and things like that for how much data that we're getting at any point in time, specifically for sessions and number of events that we're getting in time. And we use Spark Streaming to aggregate those, to split them according to how you know the, at the most granular level, and to make sure that and we want uh, we used Elasticsearch as our database because of its uh, quick aggregation capabilities. Being a search database, it's very 
easy to uh, establish aggregation protocols with any kind of, uh, you know, not just sums, not just counts, any kind of uh, queries that you can feed into it, any kind of functions that you can build into Elasticsearch that allow you to do things, you know, really fancy kind of aggregations, which are uh, extremely important when it comes to a system like forecasting, because uh, so, like I said, we divided our data into all these various dimensions. And once it's divided into dimensions, the number of your data points that you get can be quite low. For example, let's say we have you know a session coming us coming to us from a user in a tiny country from you know one of the least used URL hosts with you know uh, I don't know like just you know we get three points of data from them every you know six months, right? And then how do you predict that? Obviously, any kind of prediction system falls apart at that point where it doesn't really give us any usable data. So um, it's really important to do hierarchical forecasts, right? Doing forecasts at every level, doing forecasts at the highest level, which is the total number, and then dividing it by one dimension, doing forecasts there, dividing by another dimension, doing forecasts there, and establishing a kind of pecking order where we make sure that the forecasts at the lowest level affect the forecasts at the highest level in the right way. Right, and still making sure that no forecasts is left behind, essentially, or like no specific use cases left behind. Um, therefore, instead of using any kind of um, modeled prediction system like Arima or something, we needed something that could establish a more generic seasonality. So for that, we wanted we used the Fourier partial sums, and we uh, implemented that with Facebook's Profit Library, which is a uh, Python library that allows you to feed in data, give it you know the seasonality that you want, give it the trends that you think you know you can. You don't need to predict specifically before you know the data that it understands the seasonalities. You know you tell it, okay, our data could probably have a weekly seasonality. You know, go go with it, run with it, right? Feed in the change points, things that you expect at uh, times at which that it might change, and people will be able to kind of better understand the way that the seasonality is being affected, right? So at every system that, the, at the first example that we built, we built it with sessions, like I mentioned. And there we have the weekly seasonality. We have you know monthly seasonality based on when people get their salaries. And when you know we have daily seasonalities throughout the day. And all of these, obviously, were on top of a trend of growth, which uh, luckily, Goyero is still growing. We still have sessions increasing, for example. And all these are still uh, implemented in the same algorithm. And all of these need to be aggregated for the hierarchical forecasts. And uh, so that's there's two things we're going, we're going into our database, which is Elasticsearch. One is the real-time stream, which is incrementing you know, every day or every minute. And we have the forecasts, which at a periodic you know, at a periodic frequency, we decide when, how often we want to forecast the data. And it goes back, finds, picks up the historical data. It says, okay, at every level, we're going to forecast it for this amount of, uh, for these many days, and then forecast it forward for a day, right? And um, yeah, that gave us a good system that allowed us to have the forecasts and the real time data coming in. And you can, you, you can even see the data that we're going to, you know, be able to see, for example, in the next hour, how, what kind of spike are we going to see? Maybe things like that. And obviously, after, once we've built the hierarchical forecasts and the, you know, hierarchical actual data, we're building, you know, anomaly detection, just simple alerting was just the last kind of piece in the jigsaw puzzle, which is just quite easy to implement. Yeah, so we have Elasticsearch, we have Kibana on top of it, just to kind of visualize everything. So Elastic, uh, Kibana is selling Elasticsearch how to aggregate everything, and we can see the data itself, which, for example, here we can see the confidence band that it builds. Right, The forecast data is in the, is the lower line and the upper line, which are the limits. The green area is the successful or like the uh, expected band of you know, data. Um, and you can see the dots of the system. Um, the way we've seen this be useful is, for example, we have um, a lot of cases where these anomalies, like for example, earlier this week, or I think it was last week, we had a network failure, right, or some some kind of network error, which was extremely quickly predict, you know, uh, detected by the 
anomaly detection system and we got alerts, right? And then later we had a spike from a specific device type, which we also found. And using kind of leveraging Kibana and Elasticsearch as the aggregation engine helps us be able to at real time kind of choose, okay, here, iOS, how, okay, we saw a spike. Can I see only iOS devices? Okay. And so we can not just see the data from the iOS devices, we can also see the forecast from the iOS devices, ju just the iOS devices, which makes it extremely helpful than just, you know, just having the forecast for an overall kind of picture. Um, yes, I think, what else? Yeah, I think that's what I really wanted to talk about with respect to anomaly detection. Um, for the real-time streaming data itself, we're really interested with the data that we're getting from Snowplow. And there's a lot of things that we want to do with it. Our sessionization system, we want to build it from the current batch system that it's working with. We want to move it towards a real-time streaming system. And we're also building a bridge to the Google Cloud platform because we want to move over from, like because a lot of our systems are based on BigQuery and a lot of our analysts are comfortable using BigQuery. So we want to move over from an AWS workspace to Google Cloud Platform and the real-time system is quite easy to work with. And that works. I go through it quick, quickly, I may have. I feel like there's a lot more. Let's just go to questions then maybe. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That was very informative. Um, I have one question that I didn't, I'm not sure if I really got it. So you said that you were doing the hierarchical uh, organization of this. Mm -hmm. So by, I guess that what you were saying is that um, you basically do the time series per, say, per device type. Then you just get the ones per country. So no combinations, basically, of these. Yeah. yeah. So that, that the problem with this is that the dimensionality grows uh, exponent. It's like goes huge. Yep. Um, however, there's uh, a lot of times that you make a deployment and you screw up uh, mobile for dot d or some some combination of these right and in this setup uh, you won't uh, kind of it, it will be hard to detect that so the question is if if you thought of a way of how to include these so the way i would do it honestly would be uh, if some some if some deployment screwed up a specific dimension mm -hmm. included in your in your I know, kind of hard coded uh, in your list of candidate time series, um, but maybe if you have a more systematic way of of. Uh, um, actually, uh, I don't. Maybe I was not. Maybe I didn't really explain it clearly. The way hierarchical uh, hierarchical. I don't know how to say that word. How hierarchical forecasting works is that we forecast at. So we choose an order of dimensionality at the way it works, and we have forecasting at, so for example, if I go back to like a list of, this is the list of uh, dimensions that you know. So like I would predict, you know, I would do forecast at like a total number of, just total number of everything, like all sessions, right? And then we do forecasting for uh, a list of device types, right? And then we would do forecasting for a certain set of device type URL host combinations, right? So we're doing forecasting at every level, at the lowest grain. Okay, so then... so we're going to be doing even forecasting for the level of device type URL host country, right? Which may be obviously does it grows exponentially, which makes it a huge issue. Which is why we do it for the highest. Which is what I mentioned earlier. So the point, the few data points that we get from you know one user with a specific with an iPhone in I, I, you know the small country using you know DE, right? Those are harder to predict with. But even the most granular combinations of forecasting, we do. OK, so, so then this brings me the next question, which is, if you do this, then uh, imagine uh, mobile goes down. So then you'll have all of the combinations that include mobile all going down. Yep. So does this generate noise for you? Or uh, how do you, do you deal with this? Or is it, or is it not a, like, do you maybe automatically say, 
all the mobile things went down, so it has to be just the mobile. Yeah, so that's where we get the advantage of using Elasticsearch in Kibana, where we're able to feed this data at the most granular level into Elasticsearch in Kibana and allow them to do the aggregation. So we don't have to do any aggregation before we actually visualize the data. All aggregation happens at the point of visualization. So we can see aggregated at visualization. Because so what we can do is when something goes down, we have filters, right? We have filters that say, okay, we filtered device type, you know, mobile things like that. And then we can easily select and have Elasticsearch quickly in the background run those aggregations, right? If we having uh, in the way you're saying it, let's say we had pre-aggregated it, it would be it would be extremely difficult to go back and kind of figure out, okay, did mobile go down? We have to run another sim, you know, forecasting just for uh, mobile. But here in this case, it makes it very easy just because the way you do the aggregations is not a simple sum. So it's something that allows a forecast to be aggregated, and which is why we can do it. So yeah, that, that's what we would do. So like, let's say a drop in sessions go down. So like in the examples that I showed here, we had a spike here, right? And we were like, OK, so where does the spike come from? I mean, in this case specifically, these, this issue is known by people in the product team. It was something that or the DevOps team. And we, it was something that we had experienced before. But we were able to independently analyze it and figure out that this was, you know, like we, we would be able to independently figure out that this was only from iOS devices and something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, how did you tune the system so you have a manageable amount of uh, alerts? Because you you want to avoid like noise alerts that uh, just eat up time for the analyst to to look into but you also don't want to miss real occurrences. Yeah, um, we're actually currently still in the process of tuning it. So like if, if you see here, you can still see that these, we wouldn't really need to throw alerts on because it's still close to the range, right? But we did, you know, we would get alerted for this in the current system. So a lot of tuning is still going on. We're still kind of in the early stages of this, you know, system. Um, but you're right. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of work to do to kind of figure out what kind of, what seasonalities we're getting right? What things that we need to look at, right? What can we just ignore and say, hey, it's a trend? Like, do we need to go back one month in the past and predict for a day? Or do we need to go, you know, two months in the past and predict for a week? You know, what works best, right? So there's a lot of things to think about and a lot of iterations that of this that need to be run. But uh, the advantage of this is a lot, there's a lot less modeling that needs to be done in a system that takes into account seasonality as part of its, you know, actual algorithm, like being a Fourier system allows it to naturally take those seasonalities into play. And we just have to, you know, kind of fiddle with how much data that we're feeding into the system, what kind of seasonalities we want it to, kind of, to uh, use, right? So we don't actually have to play with numbers or we don't have to actually feed it any change points and things like that. And that's the advantage that we have. Back to the noise, I think it's if you can compare this system with like manually configured thresholds, just yeah, not comparable. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, maybe just a follow up question, and not sure if I understood you correctly. So, you're measuring um, trends on the lowest granularity possible, um, yep. but Every how, level, yeah. how do you like? surface the alerts then? Is it telling you basically, hey, um, this segment iOS users in country X on this um, iOS operating system, I don't know, due to a new um, app release or software release, are causing the spike? Like is Elasticsearch surfacing that for you? Or are you just seeing the on-the-fly aggregated graph and you need to drill down yourself? Well, we have, uh, so what we would do is have a alerting system, which is just kind of a simple script that calls Elasticsearch and says, hey, can you make these comparisons for me, right? At every level of uh, aggregation, make that aggregate, compare the value of, you know, upper limit, lower limit, and the actual value, and just tell me what, if there's a, you know, if it's within the range. Okay, cool. Um, this is really awesome. Uh, what, maybe one question is if you do have like let's say one day something really really goes bad and you have a massive dip then would you take that data out of the because you said you you currently you always continue forecasting based on the entire historic 
um, data. And so how do you take care if you do have some some big dips or some big spikes that you know that are anomalies? Do you take them out or are they small enough compared to your overall data volumes that you can kind of keep them in because they're pretty much noise? That's a really good question because, I mean, so for example, if let's say I was taking uh, seven days of data or like two weeks of data and we had a one day where we had, you know, a big dip of data for a couple of hours, right? That's not really going to affect the way the system works because of the fact that it's, uh, you know, it takes partial sums and we understand the different patterns that we're seeing. It won't really affect the data. But for example, let's say we had like three days. I mean, obviously this is hell, but if there was three days of, you know, extreme loss in data, that could really affect the future. And therefore there's, you know, we establish change points, right? We make sure that we, at, at that point, we know that something bad went, went, something bad went down and we can actually tell the system, Hey, okay, something happened here and something happened here when it was fixed. Right. And then we can either tell it, okay, ignore that section of data, or we can say, take those as change points, right. And make sure that those kind of change points, if a similar change point, we, we are able to introduce later, it affects it in the same way. So let's say we get a new version, which broke something right? and in the future, we know, we see that something is about to break again, we'll be able to establish that and, you know, essentially learn from the mistakes of the past. Yeah. But you know, it's not, it doesn't really work as well as it sounds. I mean, it sounds really nice to say it that way, but that part of it that certainly doesn't work as well as it could. But the seasonality part generally, the easiest way to deal with it, for example, if I had, you know, if yesterday something broke and something went down for four hours, I would just increase my, the forecasting period for like three weeks and say, okay, ignore yesterday. Just take the trend from three weeks and just deal with it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, so um, I, I guess you mentioned it, it's happening in real time. Um, the, their alerts aren't yet fine-tuned a lot. Um, how do you manage trust with business stakeholders that look at this or analysts? Because obviously you don't want to burn them with like false positives or false negatives in the beginning too much. Do you have like a confidence metric that, or, or did, did you train them on, on this? I'll be honest, they have not seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've told them we have it. They've not really seen it yet. Uh, yeah, like I said um, to the earlier question, we're still kind of training it, making sure that we have the system right before we kind of explore other. Yeah, and we also kind of want to, so far we've only tested it with, uh, you know, one specific use case, which is, you know, sessions, and we want to test it with other kinds of other domains and things like that before we go out and say, you know, it works, you know, we want to establish this as a, Establish this as a platform before we can go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious how much time uh, it took you to build this kind of system. Establishing the first cut of the whole thing, I think, took about a month and a half. Month and a half? Is that right? Someone correct me. There are other people from my team here. Okay, <laughs> yeah. One. Uh, so fun question. Uh, it took uh, about a, a month and a half. Uh, do you think it was worth building it? So no, uh, for you personally, probably. But uh, I mean, uh, just from my experience with an anomaly detection, it's just like a hell of a work uh, just doing the false positive tuning. Uh, it's just like a lot of uh, uh, resources as well. Elasticsearch, Kibana, you just like pay a lot. So. Do you think it was uh, was was was? Uh, did you find anything really valuable that it alerted you that the other systems didn't? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's kind of too soon to tell, but uh, it's like we are definitely able to corroborate a lot of the other effects that we see in other parts of the company. So product teams will bring up issues that you know something's breaking, and we we actually saw it before them, right? We saw we saw this dip before you know we got we saw the message on Slack that said something's broken, right? We saw this, you know, we were looking at the spike every day, saying you know what could that be, and then every you know and then someone kind of explained it to us, right? So these were actual alerts that we saw in real time, which is why again we won we haven't really brought it out to the 
a lot of the analysts yet, but we have seen some value in it. Obviously, this is much harder to tell whether how much value it is will have in the long term, right? Whether people will use it, whether it will be effective more so than things that you know are happening so far. But hopefully, it's it'll be something like a first response system, right? Something that you're able to look at and say, okay, something might have broken. You know, can we go and establish that something has broken with like more reliable methods or something, right? If not, uh, you know, this can't really be the last line of defense, but a first warning kind of platform. Yeah. Cool. I was. Uh...